Hi everyone and uh, welcome back. I wish you a very warm welcome from BNP Paribas Transformation Hub, the Bivouac in Paris. And here at the Bivouac, we're really proud to partner with the organizers from HEC and Polytechnique for this Boost Hour event. My name is Karishma Vadera and I will be your host for the next 70 minutes where we're gonna gain some great insights into fostering gender equality at the workplace. It's a topic that's really close to our hearts here at Bivouac and at BNP Paribas. So who do we have in the room today? First of all, those of you joining us on YouTube, thanks for making the time and space for this discussion. The ladies to gentlemen ratio is about 60 to 40. Uh, the large majority of you are connecting from France and we have around 40% of our audience uh, made up of students. You are mostly entrepreneurs or budding entrepreneurs. Um, and we also have some partners from different venture capital funds, CSR departments. Uh, and of course, I'm joined by our four great panelists today. Uh, first off, we have Emmanuel Larocque. Uh, a warm welcome to you, Emmanuel. A serial social entrepreneur for inclusive tech. Emmanuel founded Social Builder, a social enterprise whose mission is to achieve equality and diversity in a digital world. The organization works on three pillars, creating the conditions for a culture of equality, developing women's leadership skills, and providing tools for people to become change makers themselves for an inclusive digital world. Emmanuel is an expert in entrepreneurship, ethics, and in AI, and, a, and passionate about gender equality in tech. She offers her knowledge by taking the stage as speaker, panelist, and judge. Secondly, we have Jean-Louis Carvez. Uh, welcome to you, Jean-Louis. Uh, Jean-Louis is a seasoned diversity and inclusion leader with 30 years experience at IBM, and he's been working in the area of diversity and inclusion for 13 years now. And he's really focused on engaging with all levels of stakeholders within his ecosystem to generate change in the corporate culture, going beyond just ticking boxes and producing KPIs. Leticia Vito, author and blogger about the future of work, um, has been working with her clients on how organizations, management, workspace, and social protection are imp impacted by the unbundling of jobs and the empowerment of freelancers. Leticia is editor-in-chief of Welcome to the Jungle that helps companies develop employer branding for the new work generation. She is regularly published on Medium, Welcome to the Jungle, Malt, LSE Business Review, uh, on her newsletter Substack, and her latest venture is called Nouveau Départ. Leticia has published three books so far, all to share innovative ideas with HR people to transform the way we shape our workforce. We also, uh, last but not least, have Marie-Claire Isaman. Welcome to Marie-Claire, uh, award-winning CEO of Women in Games, a not-for-profit organization working to address gender equality and parity in the gaming industries. Women in games are currently prioritizing work around the sticky areas that they've identified, ensuring equity and parity of opportunity, career progression, and pay for women and all. Getting more women into the C-suites of major games companies, addressing high levels of toxicity, harassment and discrimination in company culture and gaming, and working to up the financing for female entrepreneurs. Marie Claire engages with a wide range of businesses and organizations as a consultant and researcher, and recently engaged as an industry fellow for the in-game part of the Creative Industries Cluster Program. On behalf of Boost Her, a big thank you to you all for joining us today for this discussion. We're really looking forward to getting some tangible experience, uh, uh, examples of your experience on how to achieve gender equality. Uh, building on all that's been said uh, this morning by Deborah, Alison and Tara. So before I, I begin this panel discussion and hand the mic to our panelists, I'd really like to encourage all you viewers to make this as interactive as possible. Use the comments pane uh, just beside the video window to post your comments, your questions, and we'll have time at the end of this discussion to field some of those questions from you guys. So please go crazy curious on the topic of gender equality in the workplace. Back to you, panelists. So the first uh, question I'd like to ask each of you in turn uh, is to find out from you why is this topic of gender equality in the workplace and solutions for inclusion in the workplace one that is so close to your hearts? And may I start with you, Emmanuel? Hi, um, I hope you can hear me well. 
Um, thank you for the amazing uh, booster team for your invitation. I'm really glad to be here. Um, so, and I, re I really thank you for this question because I think it's important to start, uh, you know, from the beginning when we talk about this important issue. Um, so, as far as I can remember, um, my choices, personal choices, have been uh, really driven by a great need for freedom of actions. And I, since uh, I was a kid, I was um, very much touched by social injustices and especially those experienced by women. As a child, um, I've been surrounded at the same time by very strong women figures. My mother was the CEO of a family business, which at her time was not so common. But at the same time, I could feel that there was, and I could observe also, uh, that there was a lot of uh, misogyny around me, a lot of comments on women, and have been very much aware, I think, uh, since you know, a very early time that I was not looked at um, as a woman as the same way as boys and that I, I could sense also that there was not exactly the same expectations um, of success and leadership um, for me that it was for them. So I have always felt that um, as an entrepreneur, um, and I could be convinced that as an entrepreneur, uh, we could really accelerate social change and solve certain injustices. So uh, to me, it was very like um, a sense of meaning in my work to really dedicate uh, my, my company to solving gender, um, gender inequalities. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, Jean-Louis, as our first male on this event so far today, um, and uh, the, the only male on this panel, uh, same question to you. Why does this mean so much to you? Jean-Louis? Uh, it seems like we're having a bit of a technical hitch right now. We've no, lost just, just, just my mute button. It's just so classic. Ah, the most, <laughs> most used phrase of 2020 and 2021, you're yeah. on mute. It, it's so 2020. <laughs> okay. Uh, so thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you all, all the organizers and, and all the panelists uh, to make it a, a fantastic day, I, I'm sure. Well, at some point in time, you need to choose uh, your battle when you're when trying to help build a, a better uh, workplace. And I consider uh, fighting for gender equality uh, as the foundation for, for all fights for a really uh, inclusive workplace and society. Um, beyond my corporate DNI role, I've been involved uh, for more than 10 years now in women networks, women in tech networks, feminist movements, often being the only white male on the board just like today. And uh, that educated me a lot about surviving and having your voice heard as a minority. Uh, that also made me experience what I should call the male privilege, uh, which is uh, also sometimes a denial from most of the uh, male population. So, and beyond that, I would say that working with peers, sharing skills and experience is part of who I am. Thank you, Jean-Louis. Leticia, let me welcome you and ask you the same question. Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I would say I, I share a lot with the first two speakers today because I, uh, I've um, become a I became a feminist when I was um, probably eight years old. Uh, and I remember as a student at school when the teacher had us repeat, um, so it was a French school, a grammar rule, this grammar rule, the masculine form always wins. So that was the thing that we had to repeat over and over in class because with French grammar, that's how it works. Masculine always wins. And I remember as an eight year old, I was uh, truly shocked and, and didn't want to uh, didn't want to, to to repeat that sentence over and over again. Thank you, Leticia. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, I think it's the, the, yeah, okay, the image was frozen and I had a moment of doubt as to whether the Wi-Fi was working. Um, just to, to be more relevant on the current uh, subject, I've been writing about the future of work for 
uh, many years now. And with the pandemic, it's now obvious that the future of work is the present of work. And also that diversity and inclusion is the most or one of the most essential subjects when it comes to work. And the pandemic has shown it in dramatic ways. So I'm happy to be a part of this panel today to talk about it. Great. Thank you, Leticia. We're happy to have you as well. Marie-Claire, may I invite you to share your why? Yes. Hello, um, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, and thanks for the introduction and the question. This is close to my heart, as through my work, I understand quite clearly that there's still a lot to be done to make the gaming sector diverse and inclusive. Gaming is not only a cultural form of interactive entertainment, but applied games and the power of play can be utilized in many new and emergent ways, such as healthcare. We need more voices, more intelligence, more innovation and different uh, business models to further develop and enhance the sector. As whilst highly successful, it could potentially become very one dimensional. The video games industry and esports globally is worth $159 billion in 2021, with emergent markets growing in the Middle East and Africa, surpassing European player growth and Asia continues to dominate the global games industry, which accounts for 49% of global games, with over 1.4 billion players. Approximately 50% of the world's population is female, and 50% of players are female. Yet the industry does not reflect this, with an average of 23% globally, women working in games companies and studios, more often in HR and marketing roles, less in creative and even less in technical roles. And importantly, there are very few female founders and directors of games and esports companies. In esports, according to Fanatic's recent insights report on gender equality in gaming, only 3% of women are in C-suite positions um, and the report states, a constant theme throughout the world of gaming is the notable lack of female role models both in the business ecosystem and on stream, particularly competitive play. Our own research um, at Women in Games with Brighter, a UK-based uh, market research company, has also recently identified a potential correlation between harassment and toxicity online and in the workplace in the gaming industry with a drop in female applicants to games colleges and university programs. As a girl or woman, if that's what you experience online and see in the press, then why would you choose to pursue a career in the, into the sector? GDC have just published their latest survey, State of the Games Industry 2021, their ninth so far. 25% said that they had not focused on diversity and inclusion initiatives at all, which was down from 28% the prior year. The sector can do so much better and at Women in Games, we support studios to do that through our corporate ambassador program, educators through our education program, and individuals through our individual ambassadors program, which is active in 52 countries, with applications open to all. At Women in Games, we always say our long-term goal is to no longer be needed, but that still seems some way away. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Claire. Wow. So. A brief introduction there to all of our panellists and we can see all the themes that have been coming out uh, since nine o'clock this morning. Uh, we've talked about role models, we've talked about language, um, here more specifically the, the gaming industry, entrepreneurship, we're talking about women in tech, uh, education of those women, we're talking about toxicity, we're talking about harassment, unfortunately still in 2021, be it online or um, on site. Um, and we're also talking about corporate culture. So I, I'd like to, to segue into that particular topic with, with Jean-Louis. Jean with 30 years of experience at IBM, Jean-Louis, and in working with diversity and inclusion topics, how has the corporate culture evolved with regards to gender equality and, and where are we now? Well, well, that's a vast question. Um, 
no, no surprise there that the uh, the workplace has been created by men for men decades ago, and uh, they have established a let's say a, 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 a corporate masculine culture and setting up as well a de facto male privilege. Over years, uh, even with more women in the workplace, each new manager, leaders, uh, generation, men and women, tend to replicate, often unconscious, unconsciously, the, uh, let's say, the existing uh, historic biased management model. Uh, they tend to interpret the, uh, the leadership model uh, retaining and perpetuating some archaic trends that are no more acceptable in the workplace. So just like a virus, we need to break the transmission chain in this corporate culture heritage process. Uh, I would say that a messenger RNA vaccine inserted the right sequence in our mindset and leadership DNA would be a game changer. Uh, more seriously and unfortunately, we cannot wait for such a vaccine. So education is key, uh, not only in the, in, the, in the workplace, but in the early stage of education. Um, and having more women and men in leadership position, demonstrating that the more gender respectful uh, behavior is not only possible, but also produce better results is crucial. So culture transformation in society and in the workplace are essential. Getting ring of all these biased behavioral traits to set up a new, more balanced corporate culture with new alternate role models that are driving more performance and a better quality of life at work for all. But you need to work on it seriously, um, relentlessly faithfully, as you need to change mindsets, and that's a long-term battle. Thank you, Jean-Louis. Um, so setting the scene there um, for a long-term battle. Um, Emmanuel, let me move to, towards more recent times, and we've come towards um, this transition towards digital. What are you doing in this area, and, and what are you noticing in terms of trends here uh, and how are you involving women in those trends? Yes, um, so we have specialized uh, in gender equality in this evolving and transforming um, work and society environments because of digital. Um, because to us, it is really like a game changer for the future. Um, so just to reframe a little bit the picture, um, to achieve uh, the sustainable development goals, because basically this is um, like how we can track the progress that we're making. Um, and to achieve these goals and leave basically no one behind by 2030, uh, we urgently need to close the gender gap in the digital sector. Um, it has become like um, a major issue in the matter of um, the equality between men and women in the world. And while, while today the gender gap in the digital access is still very important, we still have very, very few women having access to the internet compared to men, it is rapidly being overtaken by the gap in digital skills. Skills is the new battle for gender equality. Among the complex roots causes of this uh, skill gap is basically the socio-cultural mindset that technology is for men. And this is unfortunately very deeply rooted, as uh, Jean-Louis was saying, we are fighting against um, archaic um, representation, but it's very deeply rooted that technology is just for men. And this results in girls worldwide opting out of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, subject from the age 10 onwards. So it starts very early, with, of course, it increasing in attrition, continuing through higher education to the job market. So women today hold less than 25% of the jobs in the global tech industry and whatever jobs, 
And if we look at tech jobs, really like developers worldwide, we are only 6% of women are software developers. So I don't know if you understand what it means. Like everything we are using today, there are developers behind and only 6% of them are women. So um, looking at those figures, um, combined with uh, the digital skills, fast becoming a prerequisite to stay in the labor market, uh, women risk being increasingly excluded from decent work. And we're not talking about, you know, the most um, unprivileged countries. We're talking about Europe. We're talking about France today. So this gap is basically the gap for um, that we're going through right now in France. So our, the way we are working on this issue, knowing that skills is the battle, um, we are working on two different pillars. The first pillar is we're trying to really empower women through retraining uh, in digital and human skills. So how we, we develop programs is that we help women from you know whatever background, either from very low income communities, uh, unemployed, but also women with, um, you know, they have been to schools, they have great, uh, a great background and a diploma, but for whatever reason, they are not really uh, competitive in the job market anymore because of very various uh, reasons. So we are empowering them, really retraining them, upskilling them. And at the same time, and, and it's a very important pillar, we're also changing the mindset. Um, we encourage women to believe that a career shift into tech is for them. So it's very important to create this motivation and this understanding that it's for women. And we also encourage the digital sector to proactively recruit and develop and promote women in IT jobs. Mm. So we work on both sides. We work on women skills development and we work on uh, stereotypes and the work environment. And as of for today, we have been supporting 35,000 women uh, in partnership with 200 companies, but also networks and digital schools and institutions. So one of the key messages that I want to send out there is that it is not only a priority to help women gain the right skills in this environment, but also um, bring together all the different stakeholders, not only companies, but also all the institution building the skills. So digital schools, primary education, and also all the different institutions working on the job market and the skill development needed for the economy to grow. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, so yeah, it's, a, it's um, an effort to be made on all sides and with triple, quadruple pronged approaches, it seems. Uh, Marie-Claire, I'd like to ask you to rebound on uh, everything that Emmanuel has just said and also um, you know, taking into consideration all that you've been doing with um, academics and, and in terms of uh, this education uh, pronged approach uh, for increasing the number of women in tech. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, hello again, everyone. Um, I think what Amanu said is really, really good around, um, you know, those skills and thinking about education. Before I was the CEO of Women in Games, I um, ran a BA and master's program in video games design. And when I started the program, there were no female staff and there were no female students. Um, when I left at uh, the end of 2016, um, I got it to 60-40. So I worked very, very hard to change that culture. Um, and it is hard work. And there are lots of colleges and universities who still have problems in recruiting um, female students. And like I said earlier, in fact, recently there's been this drop down, which I think has come about because the continued toxicity and harassment, particularly in the game sector, um, is not encouraging uh, girls and, and, and young women or even women who want to transfer their skills into another sector to think about the um, games uh, industry. Um, obviously, I'm focusing here on the games industry, but, you know, there's a, there's a bigger and wider picture. But I think for me as well, you know, we talk a lot about women in the workplace, 
but not enough about women leading the workplace. Uh, not enough about female entrepreneurs and those opportunities. Um, I'm very passionate about women and um, entrepreneurship and uh, working hard on initiatives to encourage more women to be their own boss, to own their own companies. Um, but this is challenging um, on a multitude of levels. The statistics of VC funding and business support for women is rather shocking. Um, an HSBC banking survey of 100, uh, well, 100, uh, 1,200 entrepreneurs, mostly women from around the world, found that a third reported gender bias when trying to raise capital. 46% of American entrepreneurs said they experienced gender bias and 54% of UK women reported bias. Um, women said that investors asked them more about more invasive questions centered around their personal lives rather than about their business idea. Um, and the um, HSBC reported that overall, women typically secured less money than their male counterparts. According to Forbes, in 2019, women had a meager 2.2% of the 130 billion given out in venture capital in the West. Um, and that was a one billion improvement on the prior year. So, you know, there's a, there's a massive issue there. Um, now, a wide range of charities and funding bodies have created bespoke programs for women, which is wonderful. Um, and in games, we have one or two uh, initiatives now starting to support women, such as the Wings Fund, set up by Audrey Le Prince of uh, Women in Games France Association. Um, and Wings Interactive is a new game fund that finances games by a diverse teams, starting with games um, from teams with women and marginalised genders. Um, they believe that the success of diverse teams will lead to more unique ideas coming to life. Um, and, you know, we believe, women in games, we believe that better representation leads to better creativity. But there's a lot of work to be done to change VC culture and to best understand how. And I still haven't worked that out. I'm working on it, but it, it's very challenging because it shouldn't be down to, to charities and funding bodies. Um, and that, so this is one of my missions. Um, because whilst the schemes to support women are a start, ultimately it should be a level playing field and women shouldn't be discriminated against when they are trying to raise capital um for 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 finance for business okay Thanks. Th thank you marie claire and so it, it's very obvious that we're not yet on that level playing field and all of the all of the things that you right. you three have pointed towards so far um show that the, the she session as you call it leticia is not over and, and I also want to bring in into the mix of our discussion here, uh, you know, to really shine the spotlight as well on this COVID crisis. It's something that we're all enduring to differing extents today. And, and um, what are the implications of, of COVID, uh, the working from home on inclusion, um, uh, on, on diversity questions, on uh, interactions between uh, women and the rest of the world um, while having to work from home and potentially manage a whole host of other things in the household. Indeed, the pandemic shed light on a number of issues that were true even before the pandemic. So in a way, we can be grateful, I don't know if it's the right word, um, for um, the knowledge that we've acquired um, so not the virus, right? The knowledge. <laughs> uh, and um, so I didn't coin the phrase uh, she session. It was uh, the, the president of the Institute for Women's Policy Research, a, a think tank. Her name is C. Nicole Mason. And so she coined this uh, phrase she session. And the idea is that unlike previous recessions, this one affected women disproportionately because a lot of them lost jobs in proximity services that was the first phase of the pandemic and more profoundly what it showed is that um, it's it strikes women more dramatically because the separation between work and life that we're used to you know thinking is a, is a, is not artificial 
is entirely artificial. And women are still, whatever they do, whether they are powerful or not so powerful, they're still left with a disproportionate amount of care work, um, domestic work, raising children, looking after the elderly, and you name what. And so what concerns life concerns work. There is no separating the two. Uh, and the period has also made it clear that this is a business issue uh, and that companies have a huge role to play. So if they want to attract talent, if they want to have a diverse and productive workforce, they can't afford to ignore that anymore. And we've, we're seeing interesting debates occurring in the U.S. around the issue of childcare. The childcare is not an, in the, an issue of individual choice. It's part of what constitutes infrastructure. Mm. So it's something that's you know a subject for for us as a community, as a country, and on the on the level of companies, it's it's something that companies can do something about. Um, I don't know if you can still hear me, if the Wi-Fi yes, is working. Yes, we can. It's, I, yes, perfectly. it's, it's all working fine. Uh, maybe I can add one, one thing that's, um, that's try, that, that I find quite interesting. It happened a couple of days ago. There was this ranking of you know, best companies to work for that was released. And the companies that were uh, ranked as you know, the best companies to work for in 2020, so it's the 2021 ranking, uh, were all companies that took caregiving into account. Caregiving both for, I mean, for all people, men and women, I mean, whoever they are. And what that means, and maybe later we can discuss that, it's, it's that it's an issue for, man it's also an issue that deals with management, not just recruiting, training, but also how you manage people and how you organize work. At the heart of it all, there is how is work organized. Um, yeah, we've made a little bit of progress when it comes, a little bit when it comes to diversity, but we've made too little progress on the subject of inclusion. And the other panelists mentioned that too, um, harassment, um, you, you know, lack of promotion for women, all these things are still very true so that even when we do manage to recruit more women, so that's the diversity issue, we still find it super hard to keep them, promote them, give them power. Mm. Uh, and I would say that's perhaps more an issue that, of management than it is of recruitment in this particular case. Mm, thank you, Leticia. Um, and, and thank you all for giving us a really great idea of, of where we are today on this topic of gender equality in the workplace, on inclusion as well. I, I, I want to dive deep uh, into some of the best practices that you've seen to promote women in the, in the workplace. And Emmanuel, to start with you, and we, we touched on, on this topic already in, in certain uh, answers that you've given, um, but Emmanuel, I wanted to get some insights from you based on, on your experience uh, how are women being promoted? How are we giving that power that Leticia refers to, uh, to the women in the workplace? Yeah, and, and I totally uh, agree with uh, what Leticia was saying that, um, of course, there's, there could be, we still could work on recruitment a lot. But basically what we're lacking is um, the other mechanism to make sure that we go all the way so that we keep the best talent in the organization. We are saying that uh, you know, 21st century onward, it's a talent battle that organizations will have to face as a primary challenge. Um, but still, the, the necessary strategy haven't been put in place to make sure that we keep women in the job, um, in the job market. So um, to go along with uh, what Leticia was saying, it is essential that companies work on this issue with the 360 degree approach. What I mean by that is that it doesn't mean it has to cost much because, you know, to be honest, it's not a question of, um, of really putting a lot of money into it. It's really about the alignment, the consistency of the action to create real change. Uh, once an organization has a very clear objective, um, let, let's just say, 
have more women in tech job, but also have more women in leadership tech jobs. So really about also the role models, because this is one of the best also way to uh, to work on, on gender equality. Um, there should be, of course, a very strong um, sponsorship from the leadership on, on this decision and on this objective, but it has to be aligned with all the practices among um, the different management levels. So I am totally aligned with what Leticia was saying, is that um, we lack communication in the organization and we lack training and getting um, the different level of management totally aligned and consistent with the decision that has been taken. And then, of course, monitoring the changes and the results. Um, so what I'm saying is very basic, um, but if uh, every one of you look at their organization and try to really look at all those four different pillars and if they exist and are consistent, most of the time the answer will be no. So um, to me, most companies should start, if there is a start that we need to, to, to start, with this uh, leadership role, with this um, creating the role model in the organization. And if you start with the leadership, you create exemplary. You create like the right images inside the organization, but also outside the organization. Um, and it, of course, it will help attract um, the right talent, not only women, but also men, because men are getting very curious about diversity, quality, and inclusion policies also but you will keep talent. And Leticia was so right when saying that today we attract women, but when they are the most competent, um, when they have been you know, five to eight, eight years in an organization and especially in IT jobs, they leave organization because they don't see a future. So um, uh, finding the right uh, diamonds is great. It's making sure to make them bright, uh, you know, shine in the organization is even more important. And um, I also uh, wanted to share one of the best practices that I've seen in getting this, um, this um, exemplary, um, I mean, board of director uh, or policy is, um, and, and, and also to show that you can innovate, still innovate in this matter. Uh, one of the organizations that we are partnering with wanted to have 50% uh, of women uh, in the executive committee. So what they did is that they decided not to challenge, you know, men in existing position, but create new position that will be dedicated to the sex which was uh, uh, not well represented. So in this organization, it was women. And so what happened is that they created a challenge internally of the, of the organization saying, okay, we are opening up this position to make sure that we have a balanced, uh, a gender balanced um, executive committee and we would like women to apply for this position. And just, um, um, we want you to come with uh, the most um, for you innovative and important strategic projects for our organization and we will evaluate this project and so many women will be applied to this new position. And so um, it created such uh, an amazing um, uh, boost and um, uh, so basically a lot of women positioned themselves and it was flourishing and the organization sent the right message to the management. Um, they have been of course following the results and it created um, a lot of air and opportunities at very different uh, management level of the organization. So it can be done, it can be done, it, it, is, it requires a little uh, maybe innovation and a little um, bold, but it can be done even, even in, in the biggest and most um, look after organization. Hmm. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, Jean-Louis, in terms of this idea of, you know, having um, quotas for women at the top and, and I want to know about how IBM is doing there and, and how does that reverberate throughout the entire company and what impact does it have on your relationships with your partners, your clients, your suppliers? 
Well, thank you for your question. Um, I want to say that we just published our annual DNI report with a lot of figures. I mean, because you cannot drive action without KPIs, and that's part of the of the way you should do it. Um, globally, at the end of uh, last year, we had 34% women, which is not yet just not enough, but we're keeping on. And we are we had a 30% women on uh, there are new hired, new hires. Sorry. Uh, we had a female CEO until last year, and in France, we have our third female president of IBM France in IBM France history. Uh, our French executive committee is gender balanced with even one more woman than a strict equality. And moreover, 80% of the business is being under the responsibility of women driving business units. They aren't just tokens, just being there for matching quotas. Um, and all the things don't happen by accident. Uh, by the way, we've been a corporate catalyst partner for years that may have its, a certain influence. Um, I mean, these, these uh, results are um, the result of, first, our profound and historic conviction that gender equality is strategic for our talent pool and our business bringing the best added value to our uh, clients. We are also convinced in HR affirmative action on counterbalancing natural, between quotes, gender trends. I mean, pay raise, promotion rate, equality, equity uh, are, are also very, very important. And, and also publishing our, our figures internally, but also externally, could be a, a great uh, lever, let's say, to, to just make sure it is possible, just like our, our Emmanuel or, or Leticia just, just said, say. And more important, we should have male allies walking the talk, especially in the leadership position. I mean, it's just so essential. And a fact that hasn't been yet raised is the uh, we should not we should not underestimate the the role of our women networks. Our our women network in France uh, celebrated their 20th anniversary last year, and I should be very grateful for the role they play in reinforcing our women sense of legitimacy, trust, and confidence and actively also contribute to our corporate culture and work environment change. Uh, that's basically what I, what, what I wanted to say on that topic. On, on the, uh, let's say, uh, client and supplier side, supplier side uh, very early, uh, even in France, we, we, uh, we launched a, a network of corporate women network. Her name is uh, Anteraella which is the first network of corporate women in tech. Uh, and we've been working together with peers, with other companies. And also, I mean, when you work on such essential topics, it reinforced the link you can have with such companies. For example, in our last uh, International Women Day event uh, on, on March 8th this year, um, we had the SAP uh, France president, by the way, a former IBMer, uh, animating an online breakfast debate at IBM. And at the end of the day, we are our president, Beatrice Kozowski, attending a round table at Salesforce on the power of harmony. Uh, that, that's how, I mean, we should work together, sharing tricks and, and so, even if it's a very competitive arena. And on the, on the supply side, I would say that we've been, um, promoting a supplier diversity since the, the end of the 60s. Um, and also we've been one of the, the four uh, items we are trying to promote in this supplier diversity strategy is to give a, a, a real room to um, woman-owned or uh, woman-led uh, businesses. So it's part of the global, you were talking about the ecosystem, that's part of our ecosystem and we should act within all these directions to boost 
a woman uh, place, represent, representativity, uh, legitimacy, uh, recognize their power, promote them, make them shine, bright, whatever you call it. And but it's it's an, an it's a global initiative and uh, and 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 it it carries a lot, so much power in it. Mm. Thank you, Jean Louis. Uh, one of the things that you said in in your responses to to my questions was around the KPIs, and I'm I'm turning my head to the to the figures lady of this panel, uh, Marie Claire. I'm, I'm thinking about KPIs, and and yeah, they are really important, like Jean Louis said, because that's what helps us to compare one organisation to another, and we are kind of obsessed with figures, right? Um, but what are the you know, women at the top of their game is one indicator that we can follow. Um, is it a good one to follow? Um, and what else should we be aware of when assessing the attractivity of a company uh, to join it or to partner with it as a woman? Um, OK, yeah, thanks. Um, I think that having key indicators and I think having as much data as we can is really important. The game sector actually doesn't have that much um, data in comparison to some other um, sectors. So it's been quite challenging for women in games as we've been trying to get as much information as we can. Um, and I think it's quite important to do it in chunks as well, to try and look at very specific pieces of work um, and not, not be too general, because some of the reports that we do have are too generalized, so they're not granular enough, which then doesn't really help you to think about how to move, move things forward. Um, but for example, in, in 2020, uh, Women in Games worked with 21st, uh, a global consulting firm, um, interested in capturing the competitive advantage of gender, nationality and generational balance. It's the first time they've done anything in the game sector um, and together we created a scorecard of the top 14 um, global games companies and focused very specifically on looking at women in the C-suite. So, um, you know, because it, the expression, you know, see it to be it, is, is always in my mind because, you know, if you see women in those positions, then if you're a young, if you're a young woman or someone transitioning from one industry into another, it's really important to, to, to have that. Um, so what we found was that uh, women make up only 16% of those executive teams. And five companies out of uh, for the 14 um, that are Asian-led with studios throughout the world have no women on their executive teams, including the giant uh, Tencent. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Google received a winning score with women making up 41% of the executive team. Um, and Google's the only company in the top 14 to achieve our balanced uh, ranking. Um, at least providing that gender balance is achievable in the sector. Uh, Warner Brothers Entertainment was the only company in the top 14 to have a female CEO. Um, she's called Anne uh, Sarnoff. And the company also has four women in their executive team of, of nine. So, you know, um, that report is, a, it, that card is on the Women in Games website if anybody wanted to go and, and, and look at it in more detail. Um, so we, we found some, you know, really very interesting things out. But then, of course, um, and, and some of the other panelists have been talking about it, but then what do you do with that information? So how do you set up things that, that, that begin to change, change that culture? Um, and, you know, I, I think Jean-Louis is absolutely right. It's about working together because, uh, you know, uh, we, we can't change it alone. I don't think women can change things on their own, and I don't think men can either because they, they, need, they need to hear things from women. So that, that is very important. Um, another thing that, that, that's been very uh, important for, for the game sector anyway is the, in uh, 2017, the uh, UK government introduced gender pay gap reporting. Um, lots of people didn't like it, um, but uh, in fact, uh, it, it has been very important. And women in games saw a rise in um, requests for support and advice from that process. So in, in, the, in the last report, eight out of 10 companies paid, this is not just in games, this is companies in the UK, paid men more than women. So that's eight out of 10 companies. Um, 
every single games company paid women a lower median wage than men. Um, now, having, having that information is really vital because why is that? And therefore, we now know we need to change that. In 2020, due to COVID-19, the enforcement of the gender pay gap reporting for large employers was suspended. So, um, you know, due to a concern of the impact of reporting on the employers. Now, that's also been very worrying because that could represent a backward step. Um, and it's been talked about um, earlier in the session, but the pandemic has been disproportionately impacting women. Particularly at work, we know more women have been furloughed, they've lost their jobs, they've had their hours cut, and the greater disruption due to homeschooling than, than men. Um, and we also know that the impact on disabled women, black women, and other minority groups has been even worse. Now, um, you know, the, I think that we're going to kick off that gender pay gap reporting again. So I think that that is, I think it's really crucial. There are lots of organisations in the UK putting pressure on the government to do that um, because otherwise I think things could go quite quickly backwards. Um, and I was interested in seeing that the European uh, Union executive is reviving uh, plans for mandatory quotas of women on, on company boards. Um, amid slow progress, now, uh, you know, towards gender equality. And the thing is, it, I, I, I hate this idea that you have to be beaten with a stick to do something. But on the other hand, what I see, unless the company is pro really progressive, it just drops down the p priority list. Um, whereas if you, if you are penalised by government for not doing something, you will do it. You will do it. And then things, things progress. But I, I think it's only part of how you change culture. It's not, it, it is not the only thing. Um, and, uh, you know, so I've got so much to say, but I'm conscious that other people have as well, so I'm going to stop in a minute. But, you know, there is some, there, there's some great work going on in the game sector. Some companies have developed really excellent workplace environments mm. and, and great ways of communicating that. So I think if you, you know, I think for women that... It, and for the companies, I think present your culture, present it to be the best that you can be, make, you know, show them how inclusive you are, um, and then you will just get great talent coming to you, both both male and female. Mm. But you know, and I think for women, look carefully, think about where you're going and where your talent is going to be best appreciated. And and again, those companies that that offer that to you. Um, you know, that's the winning formula. So, um, yeah, OK, that's me for now. Thank you, Mary Claire. Some great tips there for us as well um, as, as women in the workplace. And, and in everything that you've said, that, I mean, I think we could just probably stay here for about three hours and talk about all these topics and we're not, we're running out of time already. Um, so I'm going to fast forward a little bit and, and pick up on something that you, you've all been alluding to, which is this change in mindset that has to happen. And, as I've listened to the, the different speakers from today and, and, you know, as we talk about this in the workplace, sometimes it just feels like it's a little bit too little too late. And so to me, it, it begs the question, not just about the role of HR or the role of male managers, etc., but of our roles as citizens that shape norms in society, our roles as parents, uncles, aunties, in providing different perspectives to challenge all those cognitive biases that we've been talking about this morning. And, and these can be in our roles as students, as young adults, as entrepreneurs within society. So the question is, and, and whoever wants to contribute uh, to this one, please do, from the womb to the workplace, should this education being, begin earlier and how? Maybe Emmanuel, I, I can invite you. Uh, I remember in our preparatory calls, you were talking about uh, your kids at some point. So uh, maybe you could respond to this. Yes, of course. Um, I would say that um, I think two things to me are very important. First of all, is the pop culture. And it's very interesting we talk about video games because they are a great element of our pop culture. 
you know, what do we praise on an everyday basis? What are the, all the different role models we see on TV or on our YouTube channel? And um, it is our responsibility to consume the pop culture that reflects the most what we want to see in society. So as consumer, um, I think we need to ask what we want, pay for what we want, to make sure that um, it's spread it out. So this is my first insight. So talk to our media, talk to our producer, talk to our, to our actor and actresses, our musicians, songwriters, all those people that convey certain messages and we want those messages to spread. And then we were talking about what every one of us could do on an everyday basis. I think that we should set First of all, a goal to ourselves to educate ourselves on the matter. Talking about this issue requires a lot of dialogue, a lot of reading, a lot of you know stepping out of our comfort zone, you know, to challenge ourselves. Like, did I do something wrong at a certain point that created more division, exclusion? And um, it's it's we. We have this conversation most of the time with men just because right now when we talk about gender equality, they feel like, did I do something wrong? Did I mess up at a certain point? It's, it's, it's not a guy issue. It's a society issue. So every one of us, of us should set example to each other saying, okay, this is at the time I challenge myself. Mm. And we do that in our team too. You know, we're supposed to be expert on the matter. What do we do on an everyday basis to be as inclusive as open, as open to dialogue as we can as an organization. And the last thing that I can share is maybe as a mother, uh, you know, I have two boys, one of four and one of seven, and you were asking me, so how do you raise them, by the way? What I was saying is that um, it's so many small micro decisions every day. Do I put nail polish, you know, red nail polish, on my four-year-old when he wants me to. And when we are at the playground, there are all the kids looking at him. Um, do I let them watch, watch um, you know, Pokemon with a lot of guys on it? Or do I you know, rent uh, certain books with female role models and superheroes? Um, so those are very small decisions that everyone can make. And what I can also share is that I made a decision to myself that I want them to feel good, whether it's in a boyish environment, a girlish environment, or more inclusive and open environment. And it's a challenge on an everyday basis because I'm not the only one to educate my kids. Society does. Absolutely. Thank you. Strong message there from Emmanuel. Um, I'm going to ask Leticia, would you like to rebound on anything that was said there? And, and perhaps also, Leticia, uh, I mean, uh, perhaps also uh, go into any tips that you might have for women in the workplace and how they can do things differently to embody the fact that we are as important uh, as our male counterparts. Uh, so two things. First, thank you, Emmanuel, for your wise words about education, because as parents, of course, it, it resonates all those micro decisions about what to do and what to say. And it reminded me that, yes, um, stories have this huge power of influencing us from a very young age. And so it's super important that the stories be told by very diverse voices and people. Uh, I recently interviewed a pre-historian, uh, a woman, who said that the way um, we think about prehistoric people, men and women, is extremely stereotyped, you know, like women, um, the, the, you know, picked fruits and stayed in the caves and men did all the hunting. And this, she said, is entirely false. And it's just because the stories were told exclusively by men in the late 19th, early 20th century. And that's why we have such stereotyped stories that are very wrong because they are just about men projecting the biases of their own culture. So they basically uh, replicated their own culture onto different cultures of faraway society. So the stories that we tell are super important and we need a variety of voices to tell them. So it's media, it's 
pop culture, as Emmanuel said, but it's also the way we teach history. It's also to do with who we see online. And I was very inspired by the program, the BBC program, a 50-50 initiative that is all about showing a diverse set of people on screen and all of their programs. And I just wish that other countries would, and other media companies would uh, find inspiration in that. As for your second question, um, the, your second question about what, it, what, what, sorry, was about what women can do. What can um, we do differently in the workplace? Yeah, what women can do differently. Uh, perhaps it is, it is the wrong question to ask because we've always, um, especially recently, made it into a women's issue. Um, it's not. It's, uh, it's a people's issue. And, and perhaps we should stop asking the question of what women should do, but rather what we all could do. Um, and, and when it comes to work, for example, maybe one last thing, if we were all more autonomous at work, uh, if we had more flexibility and freedom, then uh, we would all be empowered to to integrate work and life in a better way. So perhaps one idea, because uh, we talked about management earlier on, um, let's make, when we work from home, asynchronous work a bigger part of our work lives. So there was this one company that reduced core collaborative hours in a team to just a chunk of four hours in the middle of the day, and the rest is organized the way people want to. And that's really one, I don't know if it can be called a tip, but it's really the, 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 probably the secret sauce when it comes to integrating work life and making life easier for men and women. Hmm. Thank you, Leticia. Um, Jean-Louis, I'm going to ask you that same question. As a, uh, and I, I totally respect the point that you made, Leticia, about how uh, it's not a question, it's not a, a woman's problem. Uh, and and um, I totally integrate that, that thinking. Uh, and at the same time, we see uh, time and again um, women coming into a meeting room well we haven't seen that for a while but um we we see women coming into a meeting room in in traditional uh, working times uh where they kind of stay on the periphery or we ask a woman to make a video about something and it's like oh no 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 ask ask the guy in my team he you know he's more boisterous and he will go for it and more ambitious and and he he will go for that kind of thing and he doesn't mind being in front of the camera and etc and and often there's this reticence to st stand on the front line as a woman. And, and I'm just thinking, with regards to that kind of behavior, are we not shooting ourselves in the feet uh, as women in the workplace? And, and Jean-Louis, is there anything uh, that's being done, uh, for example, at IBM or elsewhere, because you, you work also in partnership with a lot of other companies, um, to encourage a space of security um, for women to actually uh, you know, really embody uh, the positioning that we want them to have within companies? Uh, yeah, thank you for your question, Karishma. Uh, yes, I think we, we should, uh, let's say, have some room or let's say even private room for women so they can experience their power within their, their peers and then be confident enough to, to, to play the same role in, in the workplace, um, that and women network play that role. We the the our network self empowered to create such. Um, a, what the name of the session is? I can't remember the name exactly of the session they they, they created, but but it's about about being empowered, and uh, and and there to 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 show your 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 talents, and it has been. It has proved a lot of uh, efficiency on, on, on raising the level of confidence and legitimacy on, on women. And um, so, yes, we can do that. Uh, being part of the, you, you know, during the, the pandemic, we all have, um, we had some uh, a special all hand session uh, remotely, um, digitally, and it's it's a it was a collection of two minutes uh, capsules, let's say video capsules, where we could talk about our success or our question, whatever we call it, and 
all these capsules, video capsules, were integrated into a, a global report, and that gave room to many women that weren't showing up uh, before pandemic just to express themselves, express their role uh, within the company, within society with some um, other other role they can play as a mother, as a uh, NGO leader or whatever. So it was really refreshing and the people can realize that we can have many roles in, in, in many areas. And another point that I wanted to raise is the fact that we should all realize that the workplace is our common ground. And as our common role, we should be all actors and responsible for it. Mm. So when we see something that distract that, uh, that common ground or that, 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 that gives it a, a, a bad taste or whatever, we should step up and, and, and I mean, not be a, a bystander. Uh, but but an upstander and and go to the uh, the HR processes that have been put in place. Say, okay, th this is what I experience, and we should all fight against that um, like a bad behavior or whatever you call them. And and I think it it's reinforced the fact that we could all be ourselves in the workplace. Hmm. Thank you, Jean Louis. Men and um... women together. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I, I'm really hoping that uh, I've managed to field some of the questions that you guys have been putting into the chat. Um, we're really getting towards the end of our time. We've got about three minutes left. And before uh, I, I um, uh, close this session, guys, I wanted to just do a quick round table of the four of you to find out from you what, what are your confidence levels moving forward to attain a uh, where we need to be in the next three years, in the next five years, maybe even a longer term. Um, how confident are you feeling about the direction that we're going in? Marie-Claire, may I begin with you? Okay, yeah, you can. Um, no, I, I'm, I feel confident. I do feel confident. But I think that there are lots of potential hazards. So um, I can see a route to uh, successfully changing things. But I, I'm, I'm just wary of certain things that might start to get in the way. So I think it's, it's for me, as the CEO of Women in Games, it's me keeping an eye on the territory, looking at what, what might be challenging in the, in the territory, and pivoting and changing if, if the things that I thought were what was needed are now not what's needed. And I think that's quite important all the time because you can preset ideas about what, what you think needs to be done but the world has a funny um way of surprising us you know even if we take co you know who would have thought that in this last uh, you know year with covid the things that um you know ha have have happened there uh, bad and also i think earlier someone said you know something good too because we've learned some things i think as a as a society and culture we we've learned some things to, to come out of that so that's that yeah that's that's a bit waffly, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that's my final remark. Thank you, Marie Claire. Not a straightforward response, effectively. To it's not easy to find no. one to that question. Emmanuel. <laughs> okay. What uh, makes me very um, hopeful is the fact that um, every one of you will set themselves goals and ask for results. Mm. And if every one of you ask during interviews, uh, during evaluation times, where are we on this diversity, inclusion, and equality policy? What do we do with it? Where are the results? Uh, and, and what's not working? Um, it will change very fast. It's not a question of the company. It's your problem. Thank you, Emmanuel. Jean-Louis, may I ask you? Of course you can. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'm, 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 a, I'm a natural optimistic, so I would, I would say that I strongly believe we're going to come to a result. But as I said previously, that's a long-term battle. And you need to be uh, willing to fight, willing to drive results, 
and be resilient when sometimes it doesn't come at a speed you would like to. Uh, but it's an essential uh, battle. And I say with the young generation coming, it's not a question of uh, being the right thing. It's about being ethical with, with, the, with our attitude as work at work. And I think it's, it's something that's getting a more and more emphasis for new, young generation. So I strongly believe we're going to progress very quickly on, on that topic. Fantastic. Thank you, Jean-Louis. And finally, last but not least, Leticia, what about you? I'm also quite optimistic, not when I, not by seeing at the current situation, which, which is very dramatic, but thinking about the cultural shift that has occurred over the past few months and years, and that the new, the young, today's young, they are much more sensitive, they're much more activists when it comes to um, not accepting a narrow definition of gender, uh, you know, be more inclusive when it comes to the different sexual orientations and all those things, I noticed a clear difference with the young generations. And I think that we're going through a very strong cultural shift in spite of all the, you know, resistance and conservatism that there is progress in on the cultural front. Mm, great. Thank you very much, Leticia. And uh, yeah, absolutely. A thumbs up from Jean-Louis and, and uh, from here at the Bivouac as well. Uh, great optimistic uh, words about progress to finish uh, this, this um, round table. <laughs> I'm, I'm really sorry actually that this is all we have time for, for today's uh, round table discussion with the four of you. Um, and uh, really, uh, thank you so much. I think we could have carried on for a, a couple of more hours easily on these topics because there are so many things that we touched upon but haven't had the time to uh, scratch really the surface of them. Um, to you guys, uh, enjoy the rest of the event. See you again this afternoon for the next part of Boost Her, where more exciting discussions and keynotes await you at 2 p.m. CET. Thank you uh, to all our panelists, to all our viewers uh, and to the organizers of Boost Her. Bye bye.